everyone um, to uh, an event that has graciously been um, hosted by the Institute for the Study of Muslim Societies and Civilizations here at Boston University. Um, this is actually part of an ongoing seminar series, which is part of a newly formed group um, in process um, called the South Asia Studies Consortium in Boston. And, um, where uh, a group of scholars uh, in the Boston area who are working on issues to do with South, South Asia. And we've been, um, we had our first organizational meeting, was it a year ago? And we're just sort of getting, getting off the ground here. And we have a website in process. Do you want to, what is the, do you know what the potential address is? I do not remember. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> But um, I guess if you type in, what is it, Boston South Asia Studies Consortium in a month or so? Yeah, you should be able to get Yeah, that. yeah. And, uh, and I'm also going to pass around a, um, a list here if you'd like to receive our, be on our email list, uh, then please put your name, name down. Before I um, turn to um, our speaker for today, uh, since it's a, well, it's a small group, I guess, um, it would be nice if we could just have some brief introductions, if you could say what your name and interest in. Yeah. Um, Dr. Mustafa with the Anthropology Department, working in uh, Islamic mysticism. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Melinda Crocus, I'm a PhD student here in uni, in the State Professor's Program, and I'll be working probably with Turkish Sufism um, and its connection with literature, 13th, 14th century literature, and contemporary global Sufi organization. Arindam Dutta, I teach at MIT. Uh, I'm currently working on relationships between economic and aesthetic theories in relation to architecture. I'm Sarah Garlington, I'm a student in the in disciplinary social work and sociology. Um, I'm so interested in the relationship between religious fundamentalism and globalization in terms of how communities use religion to their own identity. Keisha Ali, a professor in the religion department. I teach mostly in the field of Islamic studies, and uh, my personal research interest is Islamic law, but I also teach sometimes in Islam in America and look at Bellamy Hiddin in that context. <coughs> I'm Erin. I'm a first year PhD student in the religion department. I'm in Professor Ali's class as well as people in this row. So. I'm Jacqueline. Uh, I'm a first year MA student in the Islamic Studies program, and uh, I study uh, South Asian uh, Islam in the Shia context in Iran. Hi, I'm Sherry Raven. I'm a junior in the religion department. I'm studying religion in America. I'm Mr. Ali, a DC in the IR department, and I call to I'm Scott Gardner. I'm a PhD student here in the Islamic Studies program in the <coughs> department. And I study Al Ghazali mostly and philosophical and mystical traditions. Um, Merlin Swartz, uh, Department of Religion and Islamic Studies. Uh, my name is Nasi Kimria. I uh, teach in the sociology department So welcome everyone. I, I'll pass this around if you'd like to sign up for the uh, South Asia Studies Consortium mailing list. Um, and, uh, many thanks to Michael Carroll for you know helping to organize this event and the wonderful posters, which I can <laughs> I don't know how he does, but he manages to pull together. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome Frank uh, Frank Carroll and. Um, there is the, the title of his talk. <laughs> the title of his talk, and um, uh, yeah, uh, well, so Frank has a very, very long and distinguished record. And I think. <laughs> 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 yeah. it, it'll stop. Uh, in a <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So 
I mean, it's, 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 it's an old building. It's a sign. So I, um, you know, I think is the book um, Singing Modernity based on this research? Yes. This research. Oh, no, sorry. It's on the, the school of mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so he's been on leave, uh, but he's retired this semester. He's been um, on a Guggenheim Fellowship working um, on a book, Singing Modernity. Um, and he is the author of numerous publications and books, um, including Jose Trinidad, which won the prestigious Premio Pietra International Book Award in 2002. Um, so we're very uh, pleased to have Frank, um, Professor Frank Carlman. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, this is going to be a very preliminary, sketchy, descriptive uh, presentation. It's not going to be very analytical uh, because it is a new project, which I've just been working on sort of in my spare time, but I want to uh, spend a lot more time working on it in the future, uh, beginning with a trip to Sri Lanka this summer. Uh, but primarily I've been, I've been doing sort of an oral history project with uh, contemporary uh, students of Bawa Muhayyidin, the, uh, the uh, person at the center of this talk today, in Philadelphia, where his mosque was founded and where, uh, where near where he is also buried. Um, so I changed the title slightly from the uh, flyer that you all received. I added from Guru to Sheikh. So because I'm pre- providing you an, an historical outline of Bawa's life from 1942, when he was essentially discovered until he died in 1986. Uh, There was this transition made, which um, I believe was a conscious one, to move from an identification of a a South Asian guru to a more Islamic (coughs) sheikh-like figure. And I'll try and spell out the logic behind this as I go. Um, One apology that I'll I'll just throw out there before I begin. Uh, that flyer you got, by the way, had a little sort of map of South Asia on it. And ironically, I don't know how this happened, but Sri Lanka completely got excised. <laughs> <laughs> and today we are, we're talking about Sri Lanka, that little pear-shaped island off the southern tip of India there. And um, right there. And uh, that, that's what we're going to be talking about. That's where we start our journey for attempting to trace the history of this man right here, Guru Bala Muhayyadin. Um, somewhere between 1940 and 1942, uh, a mysterious figure emerged out of the jungles, have a seat. A mysterious figure emerged out of the jungles near the southeastern uh, pilgrimage site in Sri Lanka known as Kataragama, a uh, sacred space shared by all of the religious traditions of South Asia, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, this was a, based on a chance encounter, which I will come back to later. And this uh, led to a fairly remarkable career, which I want to uh, explore today. But in order to do that, I need to first go back and make some uh, mythic associations, myth in the positive sense of the term, as the essence of reality, not as something uh, mythic as it is used in popular culture as perhaps something false or uh, non-historical. Um, so we might want to call it a cosmic association rather than a mythic association. The first association I want to discuss is the pilgrimage site in Sri Lanka known as Adam's Peak. Adam's Peak, as some of you may know, is, well, let me go to the map here so you can have a look. Adam's Peak is located very near the capital uh, city of Sri Lanka, Colombo. It's called Sri Pada, or the sacred foot, footprint, the reason being that all of the religious traditions practiced in Sri Lanka consider it to be a sacred site for varying reasons. For Muslims, it's believed that it's the place where Adam fell when he was cast out of paradise, and the footprint that is represented in Sri Pada is his. It's believed that he spent 700 years doing penance there, standing on one foot, after which 
he went through a slit in a cave nearby Adam's Peak that I'll return to and was reunited with Eve in some accounts in Jeddah, according to other accounts in Mecca. This is part of Sri Lankan lore about why this particular uh, region is sacred for Muslims. The second uh, cosmic association that we need to make is with the pilgrimage site of Kataragama, which Muslims translate as being the place of light, Gatir Kaman in Tamil. And so they have their own folk etymology of what it means. And it means the place of light, and it's associated with a figure known as Khaja Khizr, sometimes known as Hayat Naviyapa in the Sri Lankan context, the primordial father uh, prophet, you could say. And this figure is thought to be um, eternally youthful. And Bala is often associated with Khaja Khizr. And of course, he was discovered in Kataragma, as we'll find in just a moment. And so that mythic association is made. Khaja Khizr is said in Sri Lanka to appear to people every decade in dreams. And the person to whom he appears then dies and goes directly to heaven. So Bawa, through his association with Khaja Khizr, is considered to be eternally youthful and also a father figure. So through his association with Adam and Adam's peak, he is Bawa, which is the Tamil rendering of the Turkish Baba, uh, for father or a, an elderly figure of authority in the Sufi traditions. And through Khaja Hizr is also associated with prophethood. Okay, so there's this dual idea of um, a, a chain of being, a silsila, if you will, a, one, a lineage, but also a, an association with um, eternal youth. So some people, for example, uh, believe that he lived to be 300 years, since very little is known about his actual historical lifetime. Finally, he is associated with a figure known in Tamil as Avarkal, who is none other than Abdul Qadir Jilani. Uh, so he is often associated with the Qadiriya order of Sufism as a result of his association with Avarkal. Okay. But this relationship is only very nominal, as I, I'll suggest in a little bit. Okay. So through these various figures, from Adam all the way down to the present, uh, Bawa is thought to be an embodiment of the nur or light that passes through all the prophets from the beginning of creation down to the present. In that sense, in his physical uh, being, he's the guru or the sheikh, as he would later come to be known. But in his transcendental self, he is that light that passes from one generation to the next uh, to uh, continue the prophethood. What is known about Guru Bala uh, historically is rather limited. Okay, according to various uh, retellings of that early history. Some people from the northern town of Nalur, near uh, as a neighborhood of Jaffna in the Tamil area of northern Sri Lanka, had made a vow to go on a padayatra, a foot pilgrimage, to Kataragama in the south. And it was on their first journey as they were heading down to Kataragama down here that uh, they first encountered Bawa. Okay? And it was on this journey that the two brothers who were coming from Nalur were walking through the jungles near Kataragama, and they saw a man appear from behind a tree, but no communication was made. Apparently, they just exchanged glances, and then he went back into a meditative state. A year later, they returned, and they once again exchanged visual glances but again did not communicate. And finally, on their third visit, um, they managed to speak, but apparently there was some miscommunication since the form of Tamil that Bawa was speaking wasn't um, intelligible to these uh, two brothers from Nalur. 
Now, some people have explained this to me as being a form of Tamil Arabic that he spoke, which was archaic and therefore not understood by contemporary Tamil speakers from the north of Sri Lanka. Um, others have suggested that perhaps his um, birthplace was in South India, which m would make his Tamil dialect different from the Ceylonese Tamil spoken on the island of Sri Lanka. So there is, again, a hagiographical understanding of it, as well as, as a sort of historical understanding of it. During that third visit, however, the two brothers extended an invitation to Bawa and said, why don't you come up to Nalur and visit us sometime? And according to tradition, 40 days later, he appeared on their doorstep in Nalur and took up residence with them. Okay. So these are the cosmic associations to review that I covered just a moment ago. Adam being associated with the primordial, primordial father, then uh, with Haja uh, Khizr Hayat Nabi Appa as the eternal prophet father, and finally with the founder of his lineage or Silsila Avatal um, Abdul Qadir Jilani. So when we combine all of these elements, the nur, the light of the prophethood with the idea of the father, and so on, we end up with Guru Bawa Muhayyiddin, who is at the center of this paper. The mundane history begins with that early encounter in Kataragama and his arrival in the north at Nalur, where he uh, started ministering to people's needs. During these early years, apparently, uh, most of what he was doing was acting as an exorcist and healer. And his clientele uh, were mostly low-caste Hindus who came to him as they would to a Hindu guru, for example, in order to relieve some element of suffering um, or to remove some <coughs> spirit that wasn't desirable to have in, in the body. Um, and as his fame gradually spread, miraculous stories started being retold throughout the island. Some things that, that come up are of him giving off the scents of perfume or flowers, of him um, existing without eating. Uh, in those early years of his life, uh, he was a chain smoker, essentially. So it's, it's said that he only drank water and smoked cigarettes. There are stories of him walking on air, uh, having uh, a, a strong sense of extrasensory perception, or ESP, and finally his charismatic healing. Uh, story, a lot of, of, of his American students, with whom I've spoken uh, over the past few years, uh, often tell me about how shocked they were when they accompanied him back to Sri Lanka and uh, saw him beating people literally with sticks to exercise demons from them. And this was clearly a different kind of practice that they hadn't been exposed to in Philadelphia when he first arrived there uh, some years later in 1971. So as these stories of his fame spread, oh, and another one that, that is often told is how he could um, appear in, in multiple places simultaneously. There's one early story that is um, recorded by one of his earlier, early Sri Lankan followers, um, Muhammad Maruf, in which um, he appeared to two women who uh, were um, students of his, but they were also followers of the Hindu deity Shiva in his localized form of Kandasami in Nalur. And when they went to Kandasami's temple, uh, Bawa appeared to them in the temple, uh, above, hovering above the lingam, and told them that they shouldn't worship there. And so from that moment onward, they felt a little sheepish about trying to go around. They thought he was at home sleeping, and <laughs> apparently he was, but he appeared to them there in the temple and told them that uh, they shouldn't go uh, to this place. And so then the, this became part of the lore about uh, Bala's miraculous power, superhuman powers. Okay. In 1952, this is from 42 to 52, essentially he lived that decade with these two brothers and their sister in Nalur. But then in 1952, he eventually established his own ashram in a renovated Dutch warehouse. So he had a veranda and a garage there for his car. And uh, he did what 
Sufi sheikhs usually do, according to Richard Eaton's historical study of Islam on the Bengal frontier. He suggests that the way Sufis gathered a community around them was simply to go in first and clear land. And by becoming sort of agronomists, if you will, local agronomists, they gradually worked in the teachings after a subsistence uh, agricultural economy was set up. So the first thing that Bala did after he established his ashram, uh, and this fits in perfectly with, with uh, Eaton's model of the development of Sufism in Eastern India, he uh, started cultivating three farms after he cleared the land. One was for paddy, one for fruits and vegetables, and the last nut for uh, palmyra palms. He also kept some chickens and deers on his ashram, although he advocated vegetarianism later in his life as many Sufi Bawas do. Bawa, by the way, is a term that is not unique to our Bawa here, but is a general term used for many Sufi teachers all throughout Sri Lanka. So um, he was one of many Bawas. Um, but uh, nevertheless, he, like some other Bawas on the island, advocated vegetarianism later in his life, but he did keep chicken and deer there on the ashram during the earlier days. And one story I heard from the current imam at the Philadelphia Mosque is that um, he had heard a story about before halal meat was available in Philadelphia, they used to buy kosher meat that, that um, students uh, and people hanging around to hear his discourses would consume. And uh, Mohammed Razak, who is the imam there now, apparently saw a kosher butcher cheating. And so at that point, Bala said, well, we can probably do without eating meat altogether. And so they uh, decided to become uh, vegetarians as a result of that particular moment. Also, there was a sign in the ashram that said, everything that you experience within these walls should stay within these walls. That is, there was a kind of esoteric dimension in the earlier days where you weren't supposed to communicate to others outside what was going on inside. So there was a secretive dimension to it during those earlier days. And there was a sign to that effect in, in the ashram after it was founded. By 1962, he began visiting a house in the central and western province of uh, Sri Lanka. And gradually, he came to Colombo, where he was deemed to be a Sufi master, and started teaching uh, study circles among a more bourgeois clientele, you could say, a more uh, intellectual community of, of Muslim uh, uh, practitioners who were interested in his teachings. And gradually, the Serendib Sufi study circle was founded to promote Bala's work. And the Serendib Sufi study circle was incorporated by the Ceylonese parliament in 1974, and it's still uh, a functioning organization today. Okay. In 1966, he had already hired a full-time scribe who uh, was writing down a lot of his discourses. He had a translator and a chauffeur that would drive him around, and these people were living with him there in the ashram. Now, what was going on on the other side of the ocean? Bali meditation. Here is Nalur, where he had settled. Here is Bala again. Here is the God's house, as he called it, in Mankumban, that he would eventually build with some of his American students. I want to turn now to the transnational uh, dimension of this story. How much time do we have, by the way? Should we try and end by about 6.20 or so? So there's some time for questions. Okay. In 1968, on the other side of the world, oops, sorry. A tree fell in the west, as Bob will come to call it, in northeastern United States, in the state of Pennsylvania, and I call it the Philadelphia story. In 1968, there was a woman by the name of Caroline Andrews who was a spiritual seeker. And she met a graduate student studying anthropology, of all things, at the University of Pennsylvania. And this anthropology student was a student of Guru Bawa's in Sri Lanka prior to his arrival to do graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania. So this fellow, Mohammed Maruf, knew something 
of Bawa's teachings and told Caroline Andrews about him. And it was at that moment, she told me, that she knew immediately that she had to uh, get together with Bawa somehow. So um, the pre-fall of 1971, she made contact with Bawa through letter writing, so on and so forth. She told me the first letter was in 68. So between 68 and 71, presumably, there was this correspondence going on. I haven't had an opportunity to look at the letters yet, but I'll be doing so next week. Spring break. Yay. <laughs> so you all get to go do some research. Um, so it was during this period of between 68 and 71 that she was corresponding with Bao in Sri Lanka. And through his translators, she was receiving uh, letters from him. And finally, on October 11, 1971, Bawa arrived at Philadelphia International Airport. Uh, oh, sorry, not on October uh, 11th. He arrived on August 11th, I believe it was, right? So he arrives in Philadelphia and eventually moves to a house at 254 South 46th Street in West Philadelphia. I just discovered Google Earth, so <laughs> <laughs> can see I'm having some fun playing around with this. And it was from this home in uh, West Philadelphia on South 46th Street that he started discoursing. And gradually, people started coming in and listening to what he had to say. Here's one of his Sri Lankan uh, translators here and one of his early um, students sitting to his left there. Um, during the period of uh, the winter and spring of 1972, some new digs were acquired across the street from the original place to accommodate the larger and larger crowds that were starting to assemble to hear him. He was a very charismatic speaker, so people were coming. Um, one person described it to me as a sort of a motley crew. People would come uh, maybe once or twice and then not come anymore. Others would attend regularly. So a, 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 a body of a congregation, if you will, started forming uh, during that period. And it was also during the same period that more affluent a uh, crowd of people began attending, and according to records, uh, there were at that time, 1972, 151 paying members of the group. Bawa, during this period, begins interacting with other religious organizations as well. He starts getting engaged in interfaith dialogues and so forth. Um, and the number of attendees starts increasing dramatically by year's end as a result of these interfaith encounters. The majority, interestingly enough, were women, according to uh, eyewitness accounts of the, the crowds that were there. And the average age was below 30. So it was a young crowd. And it was a, a lot of the people involved during that early period, from what I can tell from collecting their life histories, were uh, Shopping around spiritually, that is, the early 70s was a time when there was sort of a lot of alternative spirituality and experimentation going on. So people, you hear regularly in people's life stories about how they came to find Bawa, that they were practicing yoga or TM or some other um, alternative form of Eastern spirituality. But when they met Bawa, they knew uh, that this was the person for them, and uh, his teachings resonated with their own experiences. Now, in 72, Bawa decided to um, move back to Sri Lanka for his first trip. He made four trips back to Sri Lanka. Okay? This is when the final charter was drawn up uh, for the group, just before Bawa's departure. And in that charter, it mandated three presidents, three secretaries, and three treasurers who are still actively involved with the uh, institutional organization of the fellowship, as it is now called, which is located on Overbrook Avenue now in uh, Philadelphia. Today, there are 16, 16 members of the executive committee that run the Guru Bala Fellowship. And they gradually moved into this home here uh, on Overbrook Avenue. It was a, prior to the purchase, 
it was a, a Jewish community center, if I'm not mistaken, and it was eventually converted into a mosque. So I call this phase the planting roots phase, where this uh, center on Overbrook Avenue was gradually converted into a mosque. And the mosque was built as an attachment to the fellowship home, which essentially served as a community building, an ashram, and a cultural center where people could get together on a regular basis and, and uh, hang out with Bala and learn from him, and after his death to simply uh, meet regularly, pray, and do zikr, and also uh, discuss his many discourses that were recorded and are constantly being translated and edited and published in English. So um, it was during 1973, after the move was made to the, uh, the community center on Overbook Street, that I am told Guru Bawa decided to drop the term Guru. And his reason for doing so, as I was told, was that was the year some of you might know well, I don't know if any of, some of you are definitely old enough to remember, but that was the year that Guru Maharaj Ji paraded around the Houston Astrodome during his Millennium 73 extravaganza and declared himself Jagannath, Lord of the Universe. And Bao apparently was watching this on TV with some of his students and realized that if this guy is a guru, I don't want to be a guru. Okay. So he decided consciously to distance himself from that image, and this is when the transition starts occurring from the generic South Asian guru to the more Islamic style sheikh. Okay. Now, when Bawa, as I mentioned, went back to Sri Lanka along with 13 of his American disciples, and 28 more were to follow him there over the next six months. This pattern then continues to happen throughout his lifetime where he goes back and forth from Sri Lanka to um, Philadelphia. In 1974, the fellowship was officially registered, and in 1975, land was purchased in East, this is just some, some detail work of the mosque, on some gold leaf on the exterior of the mosque. Um, in 1975, land was purchased in East Fallowfield to serve as a cemetery. Eventually, his mazar was constructed there. And a community also grew up around the East Fallowfield location where a farm is, is uh, maintained as well as, as the graveyard being maintained. And there are members of the East Fallowfield community who are also involved with the Philadelphia Board of Trustees. By 1976, there were essentially uh, 10 centers, uh, Guru Bawa centers around North America, and boasting almost 7,000 adherents. At least that's mm -hmm. what the estimates were. Uh, and by 1984, the mosque was built onto, the, that I showed you before, was built onto the Fellowship House in Overbrook. And then the dedication occurred, and here is the current imam of the mosque. Uh, Muhammad Razak in Philadelphia. So as I mentioned, periodically he would depart and go back to Sri Lanka. He made four trips, the first from May 1972 until February 73, uh, the second from February 74 until the summer of 75, the third from November of 76 until August of 78, and the fourth from December 1980 till November 1982. And there are stories about how he almost died during that last trip. But as, as one um, of the inner core, the inner circle of his students told me, um, he came out of what, they, what this person perceived to be a coma and said that an angel had come to him while he was in that comatose state. And he asked the angel if he could stay for a little while longer because his mission hadn't been completed. So when he came out of that state, uh, he decided he wanted, he requested to go back to India, and he uh, sorry to Philadelphia, and he stayed in Philadelphia then until his death. Okay. So he finally comes back to Philadelphia where he lives out the remaining years of his life. 
And this is the graveyard at which he's buried in East Fallow Field. Here's my Google Earth again. It's at uh, 20 Fellowship Drive. It's listed as Coatesville, Pennsylvania, but uh, technically it's East Fallow Field. It's right off of Mount Carmel Road, where it's uh, marked by this uh, missionary Baptist church that reminds you as you turn the corner onto Mount Carmel Road that you need to repent and believe on Jesus. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's a, there's a farm there. Um, and this, a wedding was going on this weekend that took this picture. So the tent was uh, erected for the wedding ceremony there. And um, I'll show you a few pictures of the Mazar where Bao is now buried. This is the, uh, the dedication to him. There's the English version of it. This is the Mazar itself where an urs is performed annually for him. Here's his tomb, two angles of that. Okay, so what does all of this tell us, essentially? My understanding of it is, and this might not be um, completely acceptable to uh, Guru Bala students and followers, but um, there are essentially three comings of Bawa, the historical Bawa, that is. There's the northern Sri Lanka Bawa, in which he acts as a typical South Asian guru or zindapir, as they are known, a living saint, which is very pragmatic in nature, the, the kind of beer that Eaton talks about in his book, the, the charismatic teacher who comes uh, clears the land, uh, cultivates that land, and gradually starts teaching uh, about religious matters. There's the southwestern Sri Lankan Sufi master or sheikh that is operating in Colombo, who is more philosophical and less pragmatic. That is, the second coming of Bawa is the theosophical Bawa where he's expounding and elaborate, elaborating upon a kind of perennial philosophy that attempts to um, unite all religious traditions under one sort of broad Gnostic set of truths. And finally, there's the Northeastern American uh, Bawa, who is preaching a kind of universal path that is uh, applicable uh, non-dogmatic at first, but eventually comes to emphasize a fourfold progressive path that leads from Sharia or revealed law, uh, discerning right from wrong, permissible from impermissible, next to Tarika or the path, which is strengthening of determination, understanding intentions, motivations, and good qualities, leading gradually to Hakika or truth and ultimate reality. And this is the beginning of communication and union with God. And finally, marifa or gnosis, intimate knowledge, a more perfected state of union with God. And you may all be familiar with this because Giselle Webb mentions these, this fourfold um, typology uh, of his teachings. And this ultimately leads then when one is in the state of gnosis to Sufia, a state of constant remembrance or zikr and contemplation, zikr and fikr combined. So the eternal bawa, as he writes in one of his books, um, is this light. When the sun sets, the light disappears. The colors and the rays disappear. The moon also sets and disappears. In the same way, when we leave this earth, we must leave all the suffering of this world and disappear. That is Hajj. When we leave behind our qualities and establish a connection with Allah, adopt his actions, disappear within him, and merge with him, only then will we fulfill the Hajj. It is on that day that we have completed the Hajj. This is from a quote from his book, The Air of Pilgrimage. So we see here a kind of um, internalized uh, body of teachings uh, centered on this concept of light. And this was unintentional, actually. I took a picture of a picture and uh, had to use my flash to get the picture of the picture. So when I put it on the computer, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool, actually, because the central metaphor here is the one of Nur passing from 
Bala to people through personal contact. So I thought I'd go with that metaphor, and you saw the, the white uh, flash uh, on all of the maps. And here again, his gaze onto this particular early devotee during one of his discourses, again, is a transferal of, of light. So I just wanted to introduce you to some of the people who have been um, helping me get to know the early Bala. Uh, Doc G was one of Dr. Ganeshan, who lives at the Fellowship House in Philadelphia, was one of his Sri Lankan translators. He, he was a Shaivite before he met Bawa mm. in Sri Lanka, in Jaffna, and uh, decided to uh, come with him to the United States along with his family. Um, he told me that, that his daughter uh, was, or was it his daughter or his, his niece, was, was uh, miraculously cure, cured by Bawa. Uh, he used some saliva to get rid of some eye disease that she had. And so, uh, although miracles are often downplayed, nonetheless, uh, a lot of people have stories that they, they can relate about various mir miracles that he performed for them or for a member of their family. Um, here is a couple from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Kathleen uh, accompanied Bala to Sri Lanka on one of her trips, and her new husband, Glenn, was introduced to the movement through uh, by marriage through Kathleen. Here's another member who lives near the Mazar uh, at the farm. Uh, Mike Toomey, who is on the um, Board of Trustees for the Fellowship in Philadelphia. And Rob and Nancy, who are also uh, early members of the Bawa Fellowship. And finally, I'll just leave you with a quote here where Bala says, Look penetratingly a little. Look within, look hard, open your heart and look within. There you will see the truth, which is imminent in the heart. That divine gem, the light of true wisdom, there you will see me and you and the entire world from his book, Songs of God's Grace. So that roughly is kind of a very quick historical sketch of the early years of uh, Bala and his transnational ministry moving back and forth from Philadelphia to Sri Lanka. And I'd be happy to open it up for questions and discussion at this point. What year did he, did he die? Oh, sorry, I, I failed to mention that. 1986. 1986. And, and what is the size of the community in Philadelphia now? It's, it's hard to say. Uh, I don't have exact numbers. Because um, some people just come for uh, Friday prayers and aren't members of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. they, they come simply for use of the mosque. Um, others, um, Kelly Hayden, who's the secretary there, tells me that the numbers are approximately 2,000 uh, followers. And again, I hesitate with this terminology because there is no, mm -hmm. uh, the best term I suppose would be student because, the, or children, because Bao always referred to his funny family, meaning his American followers. <laughs> funny family. And so a lot of people think the children is probably the best term to describe their own relationship to him. And again, it, it's a, appropriate since uh, this image of him as Bawa, as mm -hmm. father. Uh, so yes, approximately uh, 2,000 in the Philadelphia area, and then you know, various communities here and there. Another large community is located in Toronto, mm. and um, there are smaller communities here. There's a group that meets in Cambridge uh, weekly, <laughs> represented in the back row there. Yeah. Yes. So so there uh, people are, are scattered about. Well, where are some of the other larger clusters of? of that's, I get distracted right there, but yeah, I guess the other, the, the largest is in Toronto. Yeah, outside, outside of Philly, of, uh, San yeah. Francisco. I mean, California sort of has this one that's spread over the state and between LA and San Francisco, San Francisco mostly. Um, there's a large one in Iowa. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, there's a scattering out in Wisconsin. Um, here in Boston, we have about 15 members. All these little pockets. Toronto has, I don't know, 30 or 40, which is exceptional for these branches. Yes. 
Um, and then there are places like Albuquerque, New Mexico, where you have like one. Right, right. <laughs> that <laughs> is always a plan. We call those twigs. twigs. Far away from there. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? The branches, and we call those twigs. <laughs> the, the twigs, <laughs> yes. And the twigs need to be reunited with the branch, I suppose. So, so yeah, um, the, the, the exact numbers are difficult to, to um, say, but uh, Kelly, I guess, estimates that there's around 2,000. But what's interesting about the, the mosque in Philadelphia is that um, you get a lot of South Asian Muslims that go there um, simply because of the association with Sri Lanka. And there's also madrasa there, so children can go there. and, and uh, it's, it's sort of organized like a Sunday school. So when the adults are, are in the meeting room uh, discussing one of Fawa's discourses, the children could be studying surahs in the other room with the Arabic teacher. So there's a dual function there. And many, I spoke with many Indians and Pakistanis in Philadelphia, and they come precisely for that reason, mm -hmm. because they want to give their children a religious education, and it's provided there for free for them. And so it has that dual function as being both a religious school as well as a, a place of congregation and a place of prayer. Um, I'm curious how the how the fellowship has spread since Bao's death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there, early on, one of the first things that the, the the inner circle, as I've been calling them, did was establish a printing press in the carriage house that's attached to the not attached to, but separate from, separate, not attached to the community center, but it's in the back, sort of like a garage would be. And a printing press was sent up there, and uh, um, a staff was organized, and uh, everything was typeset as the translation committee was translating work and editing, editing and so forth. These things were being uh, published and disseminated that way. So print media was a way uh, uh, that was used early on, even during Bala's lifetime, to get the word out. And that continues to this day. Now, of course, in the age of cyberspace, the internet is a useful way of getting the word out as well. So there's an official Bala Muhayyuddin website, which you all know about. So uh, we don't have to go into that. So print media is one way. Word of mouth is another. I first heard about Bala. I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, one of my undergraduate professors, who is a Tamil specialist, came to give a lecture at Penn and said, by the way, do you know, this was 1985, so the year before Bala died, mm -hmm. uh, he said, by the way, do you know that there's a, there's a Sri Lankan Sufi that lives around here? And I said, no, I did not know that. And at the time, it wasn't of great interest to me, so I never, never met the man. But... Uh, there was, so by word of mouth, people came to know of him. We'd go and hear his discourses out of curiosity. Some stayed, as I mentioned, and others left. But after his death, it was primarily um, media that was used to disseminate the word. So, of course, the title from Guru to Sheikh, there's a movement, right? So yes. there's, there's the geographic movement, and then there's the sort of religious movement. And I was very interested <coughs> when you were situating his work in the 1970s here as among people who were spiritual seekers looking to the East, yoga, Tiam. Mm -hmm. And now probably many of them identify as Muslims. And so yes. I, I'm, I'm interested Absolutely. in hearing a little bit more about that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can talk about that. I was, I gave a similar version of this talk in, uh, in Zurich not too long ago. And there are all these sociologists out there, and they're all saying, Naya, your voice Max Weber. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, this just smacks, I mean, it's a, it's a paradigmatic example of the institutionalization of charisma, right? So I, I just thought that's so self evident, we don't even need to go there. Right? But uh, one could do sort of a Weberian analysis about how this process has been occurring. Um, and, and I think there was a strategy in place there. That is, and, and again, this fits in with Eaton's model of the dissemination of Sufi doctrine in South Asia on the Bengal frontier, where first it's, it starts out as a pragmatic thing where you um, assist people in meeting their basic needs, food and shelter, okay? And, and um, then gradually, once those basic needs are met, you start introducing doctrine. And in the early days, according to all accounts, 
Um, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a heavy emphasis on Islamic doctrine. It was just Bala expounding his teachings. But then gradually, I think, there was a, a sort of a slow movement to uh, incorporate all of these various things under the rubric of those four stages that I discussed, the first being Sharia and the last mm -hmm. being Marifat or, or Gnosis. So um, it, it was, a, it, it was a, a, a progression, a gradual progression that one would go through. And part of that progression was to um, become a Muslim. But everyone I speak with, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, generally Bala's children do not like to think of it as a conversion experience because um, it's a perennial truth after all. So what is it you're converting from to, right? Uh, so uh, one can, can uh, continue conceivably to be Jewish and also uh, Muslim at the same time since they're all part of this perennialist philosophy. And um, I, I've had some really emotional uh, accounts from people there's this one guy, I don't know if you know Howard. You know Howard? Howard he did the gold leaf. Oh, yeah. Gold leaf. yeah. So Howard, he's like you know, this ex-Navy SEAL Harley biker dude, you know? Uh, and he, when he tells me about his first encounter with Bala, he just tears well up in his eyes. And he talks about Bala's x-ray vision, this sense of ESP that he had, where he could just look into your heart and read your cosmic autobiography, you see. And so, so it was that power that led a lot of people, convinced a lot of people to abandon yoga or TM or whatever and uh, take up zikr. And so um, that is the central practice of the, the tradition, of course, is practicing zikr. And he says that this leads to um, transcending the four religions. And the four religions that Bala identified most often were Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, and Islam. So when you're in this state of gnosis, Sufia, uh, you don't make distinctions between religious traditions. Uh, maybe in, this, in, in the state of Sharia, you do, where you're just um, adhering to the five pillars of the faith. But then later on, you transcend those mundane distinctions as you progress in your spiritual practice. Um, yeah, I um, not to disrupt anything, but <laughs> uh, I experienced Bao. I met him in '76 and, and experienced uh, many visits. He actually kept me here in Boston. I want to move to Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, over those ten years. And um, anyway, that's just a little prologue. But but my hope. Uh, my whole sort of uh, understanding is, is sort of upside down to this, um, where my understanding is, uh, is, is that Bauer didn't change or transform, you know, and his teaching, uh, I mean, he always held that um, he uh, taught people according to where they were coming from and what they knew of. And when he went back to Sri Lanka on those four trips, he he went to Colombo where there were Muslims, but he also went back up to Jaffna where there were Hindus. Right. And he was always the same Hindu guru to them. Mm -hmm. And he come back and he was the Muslim sheikh in Colombo. Right. And in America, he, he was um, more the, the, the sheikh, I guess, you know. Um, but, uh, and I've always marveled that it was, um, and it probably hasn't been uh, much touted out there, that of all the Islamic communities of, of America, this one is, is very unique in that it, it was a minority of, of native Muslims and, and Middle Easterners or whatever. It was um, uh, quote unquote converted uh, Christians and Jews primarily. Um, my whole experience uh, totally resonates with that not feeling like I converted. I was brought up Presbyterian, uh, Protestant Presbyterian, and um, it was more of an expansion. And it seemed like Bawa, that's how he approached everyone he went to. If they weren't ready for this or that, he, I mean, he, he, he taught them according to what they understood and the truth within it, which there were layers and layers of cre created untruths that he would be breaking away. Um, and that was the, the goal, as opposed to any outer forms of, 
of Sharia. Mm -hmm. And um, just one other thing I, I might add is that um, in my experience and in um, uh, many of my friends who are excited, uh, it was interesting that, that on an individual basis, um, Bao would often, if you were ready for it or surrendered enough for it, he would totally blow you away with showing you the Marifat or taking you as best you could go, which was often limited, in that direction. And then you were sort of brought down to the Shariat of like, okay, you've seen what the goal is, now here's, here's the work to do. And you've got to go through the whole schooling, you know, uh, of life experience. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, it's sort of like, you know, the reverse, you know, of, of what um, uh, mm -hmm. is in the form, anyway. Yeah, and I, I hear all the time uh, stories about his trickster-like nature. Oh, he's very mystical. Yeah. Uh, where he was always playing tricks on people as a method of teaching. And this is very, you know, to put it in, in comparative perspective, upaya, skillful means that the Buddhists talk about, where um, you teach at the level of the person's understanding. And uh, he, from what I understand, was a master at that, as you say. So I'm not disagreeing with you there. I'm just trying to put it into some sort of historical framework sure, in order uh, to sort of see how these transformations were taking place as a result of his transnational ministry. And you're absolutely, absolutely right. He continued to be that sort of tough, um, stick-wielding uh, person who could exercise demons in Jaffna, but at the same time, someone who could discourse on the subtleties of Sufi doctrine to the uh, intelligentsia of the Muslim community in Colombo. So. Oh, 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 and by the way, just the next thing, but a little more too. I, when I first met him in August of 1976, um, my younger brother invited me down. He had been sort of guru hopping and checking out the, all the new age scene, all mm -hmm. the American stuff, and, and I was sort of placed up at Harvard and, and uh, took advantage of his research, actually. Um, but my very first weekend there, um, I uh, witnessed Bob uh, hitting someone with a stick, exercising mm -hmm. right there in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that, yeah. I think Nesley was first, and then David. Yeah. Um I'm curious about whether there was and there's been any continuity in Sri Lanka, or has the kind of in terms of you know, what's survived after Bawa's death has it been much in North America. And the other question, I, which I think feeds into an earlier one, was you know I wonder, um, you said that South Asians in, in Philly send their children to mm -hmm. you know to the madrasa for you know Sunday school or. Um, and what the relationship is to the more, you know, quote, traditional mosques and institutions there, and you know whether there is any relationship, and how how the the mosque the, uh, the mosque that was created is viewed, mm -hmm. you know, particularly given you know, sort of post 9/11 environment, yeah. whether there's been any. Yeah, there's so many directions that this can go. Um, the uh, that's what I'm going to do this summer when I go to Sri Lanka, see what's going on down there. I don't know, when's the last time you've been there? With this civil war going on, it's very difficult to get access to Mankumban in the north, where God's house is, the, the slide I showed you, uh, pre precisely because that's where the Tamil Tigers are entrenched. So you're in the middle of a war zone if you go up there. But uh, <coughs> the center of the Serendip Sufi Study Circle in, in, uh, in Colombo is definitely thriving. It's, it's incorporated since... Uh, it was founded, and they still meet regularly there. Uh, so that's where I'm going to be spending the most time when I when I go. Um, as far as uh, what's going on, the dynamics in Philly, um, Kelly told me the the secretary that um, right after 9/11, uh, the, the 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 chief of police in Philadelphia is a Muslim, and so he posted a couple of cop cars on Overbrook Ave there to make sure that they wouldn't be harassed. Mm. And that wasn't an issue. There's a whole other set of dynamics out at the farm, where people out there told me during the early phases when they were first getting set up and so on, uh, a lot of the people who are repenting on Jesus were a little nervous about uh, this 
cults moving into the neighborhood. And there were, there were, it took some time and, uh, to work out some of these issues there. And, uh, but it seems to me that, that everyone is pretty much on, on uh, good reciprocal terms in terms of uh, neighbors and, and sharing religious traditions and so forth. And then there are people who go to the mosque, as I was saying to Merlin's question, who don't even know who Bawa is really. They just go for the communal prayers on Juma. So they go, and then, <coughs> then there are some street people who go because there's always free food afterward, free vegetarian meal after the prayers. So you have people that uh, are there for various reasons and intentions. And you know, I'm, I'm sort of fleshing all of this out as I go. Does that sort of get? Oh, and then the other really interesting thing is, and I, have, I still need to follow this up, is that through South Asian, um, through the South Asian diaspora in North America, Bawa is filtering back to South Asia. So you have, mm. as I understand it, um, Bangladeshi reading groups in Dhaka and so forth, mm. and Pakistani reading groups in Lahore and so forth, mm. as a result of this transnational movement from Toronto and Philadelphia and places like that back to the home country. So it's what Age and Anandabharati used to call the pizza effect, right? Pizza gets popularized in America, then gets back, goes back to Italy and suddenly becomes, you know, this phenomenon there. And so you, you have that similar kind of thing going on here in religious terms, where Bawa, and the same thing happened with ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, where you had this charismatic Indian guru, a Hindu guru, come to the United States, establish a community here, which then went back and, and uh, sowed roots in South Asia. And now there's this huge temple complex in Mayapur where their under Chaitanya was purportedly born. Mm. David, I think you had a question. Yeah, Frank, I actually had two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what do we know about Bawa's own um, early religious training? Are there established Sufi orders in Colombo where he might have become educated and become acculturated in this tradition before he headed to the forest? Yeah, um, nothing is known about his life before the forest. That encounter that I began with yeah. in, in, in Kataragama is the first we hear of Bawa. And he, um, he wrote an autobiography of himself uh, called The Tree That Fell in the West. I had it up there on the thing with one of his drawings. Um, He's the tree that fell on the west. <laughs> Obviously, I don't need to tell you that. Um, but very little is known prior to that. And, and a lot of people speculate. Even in his autobiography, there's very little historical data. You know, he's speaking in, in kind of a transcendental uh, tone, uh, um, walking with angels, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of metaphysics there, but very little personal data about his life. And not very much is known prior to 1942 when this encounter purportedly occurred, where he, on the third encounter, agreed to come to Nalur and take up residence and there. A, a second question. Um, but he does belong nominally to the Qadiriya order okay. because of his mm -hmm. association with Abdul Qadir Jilani. Mm -hmm. So there's a place near Kataragma called Jailani mm -hmm. where a lot of these Bawas live. Mm -hmm. And that's the general area in which he was discovered in 42. So that's where you get the association between the primordial Bawa, Adam, mm -hmm. and Khaja Khizr, the eternal youth Bawa, and then finally um, Jilani, uh, the, the founder of the Qadiriya order. So and nominally he, he's Qadiriya. And then when he got to Philly, uh, yes. I'm just curious really where some of his ideas come from if you were going to do some sort of intellectual history of uh, mm -hmm. some distinctive presentation of, of this teaching. Was he in contact with um, American teachers or gurus of any sort, or not necessarily American, but others uh, from elsewhere who might have been in a in, um, similar situation in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to remember back to the 70s who the great gurus were who sort of drifted through Philly. And um, uh, there was that guy, um, Da Frijan, right. who was a Philly guy. Mm -hmm. Some of the teachings somewhat seem, seem somewhat similar, although he, I think, was associated more with Muktananda, Swami Muktananda. Well, I think they all spoke in like a, a, a sort of common idiom, you know, mm -hmm. this perennialist uh, philosophy that Huxley 
wrote about in the 50s. Um, but I think he tried to, uh, as I said, when he went this movement from Guru to Sheikh, tried to dissociate himself from all of those other teachers. Yet at the same time, he was engaged in interfaith dialogue. And he met regularly with um, other spiritual teachers. And um, you know, the accounts that his children give to me is that he always um, came out on top. Okay, that, that is, that his teachings were superior to uh, many of the others. But if uh, there's an early publication that was done uh, prior to him coming to America in Tamil, and his vocabulary is very Hindu. Mm -hmm. He talks about Maya, uh, he talks about rebirth, and he talks about a, a variety of different things that one would normatively associate with Islam. So he was speaking um, outside of the boundaries of religious traditions and using a uh, cross-cultural religious vocabulary that was drawn from the cultural region, the ethno-linguistic region, rather than the religious tradition per se. So again, this gets back to the idea of upaya, or skillful means, that he taught to people at their own level of understanding. So to a Hindu, he might talk about you know, karma and maya, and to a Muslim, he might not use that same terminology. But it's definitely there in his writings. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he was a celibate uh, yes. all his life. Yes, never, never married. Never no. married. No. And uh, I actually asked a lot of um, female members of some people describe him because of this uh, youthful appearance, this quadra chizr analogy. Uh, he was described often by a few people to me as having a roguish beauty. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't know if that, what that term, what we should understand by the term roguish beauty, but it was used on a number of occasions to discuss him. Um, but I've asked a number of, of uh, women who were part of the inner circle, and as I mentioned, they were the majority in number, if there was any sexual dimension to it, and a sensual or erotic dimension to it, and they all firmly denied it. Not one person told me that there was any kind of sensual or erotic attraction. So it's not the Radha Krishna kind of thing where you relate to the deity as a lover. Mm -hmm. uh, not to the deity, sorry, that's blasphemy. Uh, to, you relate to the, the figure as to, to the object of affection as a lover. Rather, it's as a child to father, that mm -hmm. kind of paternal love, rather than the other kind. So he, he was, he was celibate, yes, to answer your question. Although he definitely endorsed uh, marriage between uh, his children, Mm -hmm. And he often arranged marriages. So a number of people have told me how their marriages were arranged. Michael Toomey, the last fellow I showed you, who's on the board of trustees, had an arranged marriage with his wife. Mm -hmm. Yes? Did he learn English eventually? Not a lot, no. Um, <laughs> he knew some words. And he, he was a good, he was a good uh, punster. For example, um, uh, he at one point coined the term communation which was, um, he heard communism, and nation means uh, country in Tamil. So he took the commune part and combined it with nation uh, to talk about communalism, right? But no, he, he uh, discoursed in Tamil, so he had uh, a, a crew of translators, some of whom were American, that learned Tamil during those visits to Sri Lanka, and uh, Dr. Ganeshan that you saw there, Dr. G, and uh, Dr. Markar in, at the beginning there, who was also one of his translators. So he communicated through the translators. Yes, I think we should end here. It's, um, it's getting late. But yes. um, thank you very much, um, Frank, for a great talk. <laughs>